A few hours earlier, Sean Hack's suspension ended and their teacher gave him the normal warnings and guidelines for going back to school. Sean Hack happily smiles and assures his teacher that he has nothing to worry about. He is now a changed man. However, a few minutes later, he's already out smoking with his goons whipping up other students with their belts. This is all happening while Huijin is still on leave, where he was stopping and teaching Don Chiel how to be a good father to Min Seo. Even though he's technically on leave, he's still in communication with Hanrim and asking her to send the worst cases for him to read through. However, all cases seem to be getting worse and worse and Hanrim just wants to punish them all. She cannot even choose which ones need to be prioritized. Wajin reassures Hanrim that she can choose since she's also a TRPA warden and reminds her that helping individuals is only a small part of their duty. Their real goal is to make what's happening in schools known to the public. With that advice, Huijin hangs up and Hanrim ponders which problem she should choose. Meanwhile, Seon Hak is back to his past bullying antics which now include choking a chubby student named Seon Jung. Then, they celebrate when Seon Hak beats his former speed record on how fast he can make Seon Jung pass out. A female student arrives and scolds Seon Hak for being too harsh to her favorite couch. The girl then proceeds to happily sit on the unconscious Seon Jung and asks Seon Hak how he managed to dodge being expelled. Sinon Hak laughs and tells the girl that he just had to look remorseful while apologizing and promising to never do it again. Afterward, the school violence committee recognized his harsh bullying, so they gave him the severe punishment of five days of suspension. They all laugh since they cannot believe that the adults think five days of suspension is a harsh punishment for students. After class, the girls ask Song Hak where they're going to hang out today. However, their teacher suddenly arrives and starts shouting at Song Hak for not listening to his explanation earlier that day. He must go to a special education class after school. The counselor is already waiting for him on the field. Song Hak and the other bullies are forced to go to the field, grumbling about how they already wrote their apology letters so they shouldn't have to take another class. To their surprise, the counselor waiting for them is a red-haired attractive female teacher named Hanrim. They didn't recognize her as a TRPA agent, Thus, they all start checking her out while Hanrim explains that they need to be compliant during class or their class will take longer. Seon Hak smirks and tells Hanrim that he wouldn't mind spending more time with someone like her. Therefore, he probably wouldn't be compliant. Hanrim smiles and tells him that for the first day, they'll start with some games of rock, paper, scissors. Seon Hak wins the round and asks Hanrim if he can get her number as a prize. Nevertheless, Hanrim never loses her smile. A few days earlier, Hanrim had told Weijin that she had finally chosen their next case. It was about the insufficient punishment by the school violence committee. Wajin asks her why she picked that one, so she explains that it's much like bike theft in Korea. Korea is typically a safe country where no one would steal a backpack left in the middle of the street, and yet bike theft is still prevalent in their country. That's because people think that stealing bikes isn't a big deal. And just like bike theft, School violence is seen as something that's not a big deal. Back in the present, Hanrim punches Song Hak in the face, surprising the other bullies and passing students alike. Hanrim then reminds Song Hak of his own game, Rock Paper Scissors, where he gets a slap for losing and a fist for winning. And next, choking until he passes out. She is doing all of these because Hanrim wants to crush the common belief that school violence is not a big deal. Sean Hak is wondering why their special education teacher is choking him. Thankfully, his questions are answered when other students finally notice Hanrim and recognize her as a warden of the TRPA. He squeezes Hanrim's arm to escape from her chokehold, and even Hanrim is surprised at his strong grip. However, he realizes that being choked feels good. With a smile on his face, Sean Hak passes out from Hanrim's chokehold. An hour later, Sean Hak's friends wake him up in the infirmary. Seeing their beaten up faces, Sion Hak laughs hard as his friends explain that they were also forced to play rock, paper, scissors after he passed out. They couldn't believe how hard she hit, which is probably because she's from the special forces. However, Son Hak just blows some blood out of his nose and tells them special forces were not. Hanrim is still just a chick. Later, Son Hak and his friends are going home when they notice the commotion that their school group chat has become. Someone has sent a picture of Sinon Hak getting beaten up by Hanrim to the other students and they are all cheering for Song Hak's downfall and are thanking Sang Wook for reporting him. Sion Hak smirks and decides to punish Sang Wook for being a tattletale. Meanwhile, Sang Wook and his mom are on their way home from the hospital. His mom is very happy to see that Sang Wook's mood immediately changed now that the TRPA has arrived 
and he is even excited to go back to school. Sangwook heads home first since his mom must go get some groceries. He was riding the elevator texting with Xianjun over the end of their bully days when the elevator doors opened, and Sangwook saw that Sean Hak and his friends were waiting for him. One of the bullies grabs Sangwook by the throat and slams him back inside the elevator. Meanwhile, another bully closes the doors and Seong Hak makes fun of Sangwook's happiness. He then tells Sangwook that he doesn't care if he gets expelled or punished. What he cannot stand is one of his toys, meaning Sangwook snitched on him. Suddenly, the elevator door opened again and this time, it was Hanrim. Hanrim was surprised to see them, but she immediately goes to Sangwook's rescue and kicks Seong Hak away from him. She presses the top floor button and then tells Seong Hak that she was on the way to Sangwook since Seong Hak might try to get back at the victim. And yet, she never imagined that Seong Hak would do it on the first day. She asks Seong Hak why and then punches him in the face. But this time, Seong Hak doesn't budge but instead even licks Hanrim's fist and tells her that she doesn't scare him. At that moment, they finally reach the top floor. Seong Hak grabs Hanrim's arm and starts squeezing it calling her scrawny and taunting her to try and escape from his grip. In response, Hanrim's smirk intensifies. She then remarks how her job is hard sometimes. At the end of the day, high school students are still kids, so she's never sure how much she has to hold back. But in Son Hak's case, it's clear that she doesn't need to. She then orders everyone to follow her to the rooftop where Son Hak still continues to mock her. Hanrim pays them no mind but instead announces that for their next class, They'll apologize to Sangwook on their knees, and they can stop only when Sangwook says they can stop. If Sangwook doesn't say stop, then they'll be there till morning. Sinon Hak walks towards Sangwook and blackmails him to say that everything's already good. However, Sangwook finds the courage to say that he never forgave Seong Hak for everything yet. Sinon Hak is about to punch him for his insubordination, but Hanrim's kick is faster and almost hits Simon Hak in the face. She warns Song Hak that it's time for him to kneel. Sean Hak finally gets irritated and punches Hanrim. She managed to block the punch, but she was blown away and her arm throbbed from the impact. Meanwhile, Sinon Hak continues to belittle Hanrim and removes his uniform, showing off all the muscles he has from going to the gym. However, Hanrim still creepily smiles at him. In another place, Gang Sok is calling Kwai Jin again asking him when he's going back to work. He expresses his worry over Hanrim since with Hwai Jin's leave of absence, Hanrim has been assigned to male students this time. Gangshok was planning to only assign her to all girls' schools since he was afraid that she might get hurt by males. Wajin laughs out loud at Gangshok's worries and reassures her that when it comes to physical combat, even Huijin is no match for Hanrim. Meanwhile, Sinan Hak is screaming in pain from Hanrim's kick. Her kicks were so painful that it felt like he was being cut by a knife. He tries to counterattack with a punch, but Hanrim dodges and kicks him in the side again. Blood soaks Song Hak's wounds, and he realizes that his shirt's been ripped. Hanrim raises her foot to kick Song Hak again, and he realizes that Hanrim has been using her heels to cut her. Hanrim slams her foot down on Song Hak's thigh, stabbing him in the flesh with her heel. Everyone is horrified at the brutality of Hanrim. Hanrim informs Song Hak that they would have been better off if Wajin was assigned to them. Wajin would have tried all kinds of approaches to get to Song Hak but Hanrim's only way of dealing with bullies is with violence. She then steps on Song Hak's face and asks him if he's going to kneel in front of Sang Wook or not. An hour later, Sang Wook is back in his room watching a video of Song Hak on his knees apologizing to him. The video makes him smile while in another place, Song Hak is slamming his fist into his bedroom wall, irritated that he must go through such humiliation. Later at school, other students gossip and take pleasure in Song Hak's humiliation by Hanrim. When Sinon Hak arrives at his classroom, he glares at Sang Wook while walking to his desk. Unfortunately for him, Hanrim catches him and asks him if he wants to repeat their lesson. Sinon Hak tries to explain that he was just looking and not hurting anybody. But Hanrim declares that glaring at his victim with such venom can be considered as retaliation. And since Sinon Hak won't seem to change any time soon, she orders Sinon Hak to keep his head down and stare at the ground while he's still in school. Sinon Hak tries to protest, but he immediately flinches when Hanrim threatens to kick him. Later, the other students see Song Hak truly looking down even when he was walking through the corridor, and they all start laughing at him again. 
A pair of students even kicked him in the back before running away. Seon Hak shouts at them, but other students immediately take a picture of him, not looking down and send it to Hanrum. Hanrum appears and tells Seon Hak that it looks like she doesn't have to keep an eye on him after all. The other students would do the job for her. Seon Hak tries to explain that someone kicked him, but Hanrum just squeezes his injured thigh and laments that if only the school violence committee moved him to another class, then he wouldn't have to suffer like this. After class, Hanrum's third lesson begins at the gymnasium. Before they start, however, Song Hak suddenly announces that he'll quit school. Hanrum is just there because she disagreed with the school violence committee's decision. But it's not like he bribed them or anything. He was prepared to get expelled anyway, so he'll just quit school. He was about to leave the gymnasium when suddenly, the boys they bullied entered the room, including Seonjin and Sangwook. He laughs at them and tells them to get out of the way. Seonjin instead pushes him back into the room. Hanrum then places her wooden sword on Song Hak's forehead and informs him that he cannot leave. Just like how a drunk driver cannot escape punishment by stating that he won't drive anymore, school violence is also a serious crime and criminals need to be educated. Until Sinon Hak finishes her course, he'll be under Hanrum's rule. The next day, Sinon Hak is outside of the school pondering if he should still go in. Since the other students are now bullying and humiliating him, he just decides to ditch school. If he could just wait for a few weeks, the extremely busy TRPA would probably leave soon. Unfortunately, Hanrum stops her from leaving and drags him back by the ear. She warns him that if he runs, then he'll truly learn how good the special forces are at tracking people down. During lunch, the bullies are all hunkered down and having a meeting over their situation. They cannot even look up now because they're scared that one of their classmates would take a picture of them. Some wonder if they should just skip school, but this time, Seon Hak advises that they should just stick it out. Their mandatory special education class is only five sessions, and they have already finished three. The TRPA will leave after their classes, and then they can get their revenge on the other students. For their next special education class, the bullies are all surprised to see their parents in the room. Hanrum had given them a paper detailing all the misdeeds their children had done. One of the parents' reading was Sangwook's mom, and she angrily starts slapping Song Hak upon learning everything her son had to endure. Hanrum explains to the other parents that it's important for parents to understand exactly what their children did and how much pain they'd caused the victims. One of the bully's mothers asks Hanrum if their son really needs to be put on some humiliating public display when they have already apologized. Instead of Hanrum answering, however, Sang Wook's mom shouts out that her son slit his wrists. How would the other parents feel if their children tried to take their own life? One of the bully's fathers advises Sang Wook's mom to stop slapping the kids. She's only hurting her hands. Instead, she can use the metal pipe he had found outside. The kid tries to call out to his dad, but the dad strikes him with the pipe, yelling at his son that he isn't his son. He didn't raise a monster. He then shouts out to the other bullies to kneel and accept their punishment. That night, Son Hak's thighs are bruised and wounded from the beating he received, but he knows that he only must endure one more session and all will be over. At their last session, Hanrim asks Son Hak to share his final thoughts and experiences. Son Hak was surprised at this, but he realizes that Hanrim is just another adult government employee who doesn't have to work any harder than the minimum. Thus, Son Hak shares with the others how thanks to their special education class, he realized how much pain he caused others and that bullying is wrong. He fakes some tears and thanks Hanrim for her guidance. And thus, Hanrim announces that the school violence prevention course is officially put on hold. Sean Hack and his friends get confused why it's only put on hold and not complete. However, Hanrim explains that the violence committee has an administrative appeal system where the victim student has 180 days after receiving the committee's decision to file an appeal. In Sang Wook's case, he filed an appeal the day he received the decision. Unfortunately for Sean Hack, the committee accepted the appeal on the day of their last class. Thus, it looks like their classes still aren't finished. The day of the appeal arrives and Hanrim accompanies Sang Wook to the Jeonggi Province Office of Education. Hanrim asks Sang Wook if he really wants to do an oral appeal, but Sang Wook assures her that he feels much better with her there. The members of the disciplinary committee enter, including Mr. Kim from the Disciplinary Action Adjustment Committee and Mr. Junbin Lee, a youth human rights attorney. Sang Wook recognizes Mr. Lee as one of the members of the former committee who handled his case. Hanrim tries to shake Mr. Lee's hand, but Mr. Lee smacks away her hand and tells her that he doesn't like the TRPA when the hearing starts. 
Sang Wook narrates every horrific thing he had gone through under Song Hak's bullying. And yet, even after he got his punishment suspension, Sinong Hak mocked the committee's decision and sent Sang Wook texts, threatening revenge. If Hanrim didn't save him, he would have been hurt much worse than before. He made this appeal because he can't keep going to the same school as Song Hak. After Sang Wook's statement, Mr. Lee next explains why they decided on five days of suspension. Mr. Lee elucidates that he believes the action taken by the committee was appropriate. After all, their aim is to correct students, not punish them. No matter how serious the case, there is always room for consideration when the student shows remorse. Most students deny any wrongdoing, but Sion Hak acknowledged every crime he did and showed that he was remorseful. Thus, they cannot go beyond suspension for a student that shows remorse. They also did not change their classes because they wanted to give the two students the chance for reconciliation. Hanrim suddenly interrupts Mr. Lee's statement and exclaims that Sinon Hak does not actually feel remorse for what he did. She monitored Sinon Hak all throughout her assignment and she never once saw him show true remorse. Sean Hak even mocked the lightness of the punishment and didn't hesitate to take revenge. She believes that this was all made possible by the committee's poor decision. However, Mr. Lee points out that Sean Hak's behavior can also be caused by the TRPA's extreme methods. As a youth attorney, he has been to many students and they are calling the TRPA as undertakers because once the TRPA gets involved, things go beyond corrective action. The students are treated like criminals and their lives are ruined. The videos of Han Rim on YouTube truly show that she lives up to the TRPA's violent reputation. That's why when she showed up, Song Hak probably felt like his life was over. Is it possible that her presence is what pushed him over the edge? Juveniles are still immature, so they should be given chances. Taking away such chances will only push them to commit more wrongdoings. Sang Wook can't take what Mr. Lee is saying anymore, so he abruptly stands up and shows him the scar on his wrist. When Son Hak told him he would get revenge, he was so scared that he tried to take his own life. Should they just call what Sinon Hak did as wrongdoing and let it slide? Mr. Lee replies that this is why he called juveniles immature. Did Sangwook never think the school would try to protect him? Maybe his emotional instability led him to imagine the worst case scenario. Could it be that he's making this appeal because he wanted revenge? The accusation causes Sangwook to start dry heaving and flee from the room. Sangwook cannot believe that adults don't really care about their pain. In his hurry to get away, he bumps into a man who points into the bathroom. However, the man seems to be familiar to Sangwook. Meanwhile, Mr. Lee also asks Hanrim if they truly believe that the answer to violence is more violence. Do they really stand for true justice? Hanrim is getting flustered and is about to fight back when Huajin abruptly enters the room and tells Mr. Lee that he's mistaken. Huajin explains that he understands how the goal of the youth justice system is rehabilitation, not punishment. However, the TRPA exists to protect the students and teachers whose rights have been violated. Therefore, their activities are geared toward helping the victims. Meanwhile, Mr. Lee also elucidates why the youth justice system emphasizes rehabilitation over punishment. This is because most youth offenders come from poverty, neglect, and domestic violence. As a result, kids end up in the streets and get caught up in crime. Children cannot choose their family, so the responsibility of youth crime lies partially with society. That's why it wouldn't be right to force the youth to take full responsibility for their actions. Rather, it is society's duty to educate and give them another chance. In response, Huijin narrates how before he joined the TRPA, he didn't know much about teens. As such, he played games to get a taste of youth culture. He's not very good at it, so he ended up hearing a lot of bad words. He still wouldn't give up playing, but the other team would also continue playing with them, taunting them the entire time. For him, that's also how bullying works. Humans derive pleasure from feeling superior to others and bullying is a violent expression of that phenomenon. In other words, rehabilitation is very difficult because bullies bully for pleasure. That's why it's best to separate the aggressor and the source of their pleasure, the victim. Mr. Lee asks Huajin for proof that Sean Hak was bullying for his own pleasure, but it was Sang Wook who answers. He told them how Sean Hak called him a toy when he came to get revenge. He admits to Mr. Lee that he does want revenge against Son Hak. However, what he truly wants most is to go to school without being terrified. After hearing this, the committee leader thanks them for their statements and informs them that they will give their verdict after some deliberation. Later, Hanrim goes to take Sang Wook back to his house while Huijin waits for the results of the appeal. 
In the parking lot, he notices Mr. Lee lighting a cigarette, so they share a brief smoke. Mr. Lee asks Wei Jin why he looks like he thinks he won. The outcome of the appeal was decided before it was even started. Mr. Lee remarks that the current administrative appeal was quite uncharacteristic. They usually take three to six months to finish. But this case only took two weeks, from acceptance to verdict. The reason for this speed was the meddling of a certain very powerful organization. In other words, the TRPA, which is why the verdict will be exactly what Hui Jin wanted. Xiong Hak will be transferred to another school. In other words, this wasn't a victory through reason, but power. Hui Jin tries to point out that they didn't do anything, but Mr. Lee quickly replies that he doesn't mean the TRPA forced the committee. This is just how bureaucracy works. Would the committee really go against the Minister of Education, their ultimate superior? Furthermore, TRPA's methods had already attracted a lot of public attention, and the media is sure to report their every move. However, this isn't going to end with Son Hak's transfer or expulsion. Due to the results of the case, Son Hak was thrown out of his gym. Not only that, but everywhere he goes other people are now making fun of him. The mistakes he made as a youth will affect Son Hak for the rest of his life. Mr. Lee then asks Hui Jin if branding a minor like that is okay. Hui Jin replies that if Sean Hack truly feels remorse, then he will view that branding as retribution, not a shameful marking. After all, Hui Jin has seen this happen time and again while doing this job. The first step toward a second chance is true self-reflection. Mr. Lee tells Hui Jin that they probably won't see eye to eye, but he also promises Hui Jin that if the TRPA ever gets dissolved, then he probably have a role in it. He then drives away, leaving Hui Jin behind who feels like they will probably meet again. Suddenly, Hui Jin's phone rings and when he answers it, to his surprise it was Yeri Han asking him for pizza. A few hours later, Hui Jin is at their prison bringing her pizza. The truth was Yeri invited him to visit because of an issue with another inmate. The other girl accompanying Yeri introduces herself as Yu Jong Oh, a girl in prison because she murdered someone. The problem is that her sister, a third year in middle school, is missing. Yu Jong explains that their father was abusive, so she left home in her first year of high school. Half a year ago, her sister contacted her to tell her that she had also run away. They would write each other letters occasionally, but she got one last letter two months ago, and then they stopped. Yu Jong hands the letter to Hui Jin, but she suddenly freaks out. Yuri calms her down and tells her that Hui Jin is not a bad man. It turns out that Yu Jong has a fear of men. Reading the letter, Hui Jin learns that Yu Zhang's little sister found someone to take care of her before all the letters suddenly stopped. Yeri then asks Hui Jin if he had ever heard of the term helpers. Meanwhile, in a secluded place somewhere, a girl is trying to quietly sneak out but sadly, she was caught. Yu Zhang narrates that the person she murdered was a helper. The guy gave him food and shelter. But every night, he would do things to her. One night, she couldn't take it anymore, so she hit his head and accidentally murdered him. She's worried about what situation her sister might be in right now and she's not even sure if she's still alive. Yuri consoles the crying Yu Jung and promises her that she'll and Wei Jin will find her sister. Hua Jin is surprised to hear this, but Yuri just looks at her with a scheming face. A few hours later, Hanrim is surprised to see Hui Jin with Yuri, who is now out of prison. She angrily berates Hua Jin but Yuri points out that if they want to catch a helper, they would need the help of a minor like her. Yuri points out that Hanrim wouldn't pass off as a minor, so they need her help. The two girls start arguing and Hui Jin leaves, telling them that they should split up so their search would be more efficient. A few minutes later, Yeji starts taking pictures and finishes creating her account. She then posts a tweet looking for people willing to help a runaway. In less than five minutes, the two girls watch as thirsty men start messaging her telling her that they can give her money and a place to stay. Yuri hypothesizes that if Yu Jong's sister is being held captive, then she's probably being forced to do illegal work. As such, they should try the men offering work first. Later, Yuri meets up with a guy and gets into his car. Meanwhile, Hanram stealthily follows them in her own vehicle. The man starts bragging about money so Yuri asks him if he really has a job for her. However, the guy admits that he's willing to let Yuri stay with him for a few days. Annoyed that her plan failed, Yuri demands that she be dropped off. When the man protests, she angrily shoves open the door, damaging it against a pole on the side of the road. The man stops the car to check on his car and curses Yeri, but Yeri kicks him away. The man threatens to take her to the police, but Yeri points out that he's done worse for abducting a minor. She then leaves and goes back to Hanram. 
With their first target of failure, Yeri was about to message another man when she noticed that there was news about a middle school runaway being murdered. Wejin hurriedly goes to the police and shows them a picture of Yu Jong's sister, asking them if she was the girl found dead. After his trip to the police station, Huijin calls Hanrim and Yeri to inform them that the victim wasn't Yu Jong's sister. Nevertheless, this is still bad for them because when a case like this happens, it makes the other helpers more nervous which leads to more incidents. Meanwhile, the next scene shows that the girl who tried to run away earlier was Yu Jong's sister, and she was beaten up for trying to run away. The person who beat her up reports to the others that the girl might not be able to work for a while since her face is messed up a bit. Instead, they can just get a different girl. The person had also seen Yuri's posts on social media. Later that night, Yuri and Hanrim are planning their next move when Yuri points out that it doesn't make sense that Yu Jong's sister would go to a helper. After all, if she knows that Yu Jong went to prison for murdering a helper and Yu Jong also warned her sister how dangerous they are. That means there's something that could help them narrow down their suspects. The two then start eating when they abruptly hear a commotion coming from another room. They quickly go to investigate, and they see a girl running away. They follow the girl to a stairwell where they see a man beating up the girl who tried to run away. Hanrim immediately punches the man and attempts to call the police. However, the girl quickly stops her and begs her not to call the authorities. Hanrim tries to assure her that she won't get into trouble, but the girl points out that the police would contact her parents. She would rather die than go home. Hanrim was surprised at this, and even more so when Yeri suddenly held her down. Yeri then tells the girl to run away while she holds down Hanrim. After the girl leaves, Hanrim angrily asks Yeri why she stopped her when they could have helped the victim. However, Yeri coldly explains one thing she had learned from her time in prison is that there are more hellhole homes than anyone can imagine and the only answer for kids is to run away. Unfortunately, all authorities call the parents, including shelters and the police so kids cannot ask them for help. They can't even get part-time jobs without their parents' permission. There's nothing a runaway can do. Meanwhile, Huijin calls Hanrim and tells her that he has been talking to another group of runaways. From them, he learned that there might be one helper who could have convinced Yu Jong's sister to lower her guard. He then sends the suspect's profile to Hanrim, and the two girls immediately agree that the suspect might be their target. The next day, Yeri meets with their suspect, a woman helper. Yeri narrates to the helper how she's been running away from home for the last six months. The helper assures Yeri that she knows what it's like to be a runaway girl since she also ran away when she was 15. That's why she now spends her free time helping other girls like her. There are more girls like Yeri in her place. Meanwhile, Hanrim is eavesdropping on their conversation from a listening device on Yeri. Yeri shows the woman a photo of Yu Jong's sister and asks her if that girl is in her place. She explains that she's a friend of her sister and she ran away too. The woman thinks for a moment and asks Yeri if she's talking about Yeonjong oh since she is at her place. A little while later, she brings Yeri inside a house where a group of girls are also staying. The woman asks where Yeonjong is, and the girl explains that she went out for a while. As such, the woman volunteers to cook since they have a new housemate while Yeri chats with the other girls. One of them introduces herself as Seo Leon and tells Yeri that they aren't expected to do anything so she can just relax. They then share a meal while Hanrim is also eavesdropping and eating in her car. The woman gives Yeri more food and reassures her again, telling her that there are no men there and they are just like one big family. Looking at the smiling faces of the other girls, it does look like a family. However, Yeri still wasn't fooled since she knows it's impossible for a group of teenage girls to live together and none of them be bossy. These girls are probably planning something since she used to do the same thing all the time way back in her bullying days. A few hours later, Yeri falls asleep, and the other girls immediately encircle her. The helper woman tells them that they know what to do and leaves the room with Seo Leon. Outside, Seo Leon asks the helper how she always makes new girls fall asleep so quickly. The woman explains that runaway kids are usually starving and tired, so if someone just gives them some food and makes them comfortable, sleep comes naturally, especially in a place with a warm family atmosphere. Meanwhile, the other girls inside start taking pictures of Yeri and are about to pull up her skirt when Yeri finally stops pretending she was asleep. The helper and Seo Liang suddenly hear a loud racket coming from inside the house and when they enter, they see that Yeri had knocked out most of the girls. Yeri had learned that they were forcing girls to work for them by taking naughty pictures of them and using that as blackmail. Seo Liang angrily kicks Yeri, 
but Yuri is quicker and electrocutes Siolion with a hidden taser. Scared that she's next, the helper quickly dials someone on her phone and tells them that she needs help in room 6. Yuri laughs and tells her that she's not alone either. Outside, a man goes out of a car to enter the house, but Hanrim is already blocking his way. Inside the house, Yuri is electrocuting the helper and demanding that she reveal where Yunjong truly is. The helper explains that Yunjong is currently working. She's out fooling around with lecherous old men. Yuri was about to attack the woman again in anger, but more girls abruptly arrive from outside. Seeing their boss being attacked, they quickly go to her defense. Outside, Hanrim had knocked out the guy who tried to enter the house when she heard from her phone that Yuri was being overwhelmed by the other girls. The helper orders the other girls to bring Yeri to the boys' room, so she'll learn her lesson. The girls drag Yeri outside, but thankfully Hanram has arrived and punches the girls. She then grabs Yeri's hand, and they flee outside. The boys from the boys' room also see them and start chasing them too. Thankfully, they manage to hide from the numerous runaway kids by hiding on the rooftop of a building. Hanram wonders how many kids the helper has and Yuri guesses that it must be at least six rooms full of people because the woman called their room Room 6. But first, Yuri implores Hanram to look for Yunjong since she might be in danger at her work. Hanram's phone suddenly buzzed, and it was Huajin informing them that she might have found Yunjong. Meanwhile, the helper is scolding and beating up the runaway kids for failing to capture Yuri. They plan to ask Yunjong if she knows Yeri since she's clearly the one Yeri was looking for. Meanwhile, Siliang asks their helper why Yunjong is working when her face still isn't fully healed. The helper admits that Yunjong's client tonight doesn't seem to care about her face as long as she's a middle school student. Yunjong is in a car outside a karaoke place where her guard is yelling at her to get out of the car and start working. Yunjong begs her guard if she can skip tonight since she has a bad feeling about her customer today. Not only that, but she's also afraid due to the recent news of a runaway girl being murdered. Her guard reassures her that he'll protect her if she does her job right. Thus, her guard leaves her behind, promising to pick her up when the job is done. Yanjong notices a couple of policemen patrolling, and she was about to ask them for help when she remembers how her father used to beat her. The memory stills her hand, and she forces herself to go to her job. Upon entering her customer's room, she is horrified to see the guy singing a crazy song. However, the guy stops singing when she enters and asks her if she wants a turn at the karaoke. The guy is waging himself pretending to be a customer. An hour later, Yanjong is confused since she only spent the whole time singing. The man's time is almost up and yet he never laid a finger on her. Out of nowhere, the man then calls her name and tells her that he was there because her sister asked him for help. She gets horrified when he sees the man has her sister's letter and she asks him how she got her letter. Is he stalking her? Does he have her sister? Wajin tries to calm the panicking girl down, but Yunjong abruptly runs away from the room. Outside, Wajin manages to catch up to Yunjong and stop her, but her guard suddenly interrupts him. The guard tells him that if he wants more time, he'll have to pay more. Wajin punches the guy numerous times and tells him that that's his payment. He was about to go talk to Yunjong again, but she had already gotten into a cab that drove away. Thankfully, Hanrim and Yeri quickly arrive in their own car and they call out to Huijin to get in. Meanwhile, Yunjong is being scolded by the cab driver after he found out that she doesn't have any money. She promises to pay him back if he just leaves his phone number. But the cab driver already has other plans. He recognizes from her clothes that Yunjong must be a runaway teen working the streets. So instead he offers that she stays in his place as payment. Yunjong realizes what the man wants, and she quickly runs away again. She had never understood why her sister ran away when she was little. Her sister was always positive, had good grades, and never made any trouble. And yet, when she was in her first year of middle school, her sister left their home. She couldn't understand why, but a few years later when her body started maturing, she finally understood why. Her sister had no other choice and so did she. When she ran away, she tried to get a job to support herself, but the establishment asked for her parents' contact information. She tried to explain that her father would never permit them and instead would come and get her again but the establishment owner tells her that it's the law that they cannot take responsibility for her without her parents' consent. She leaves without getting a job, and that's when she meets the woman helper. Yunjong knows that almost no adult will help runaway teens like her without any ulterior motives. But if she wanted to stay alive, she had no choice. Thus, she accepted the woman's offer. Back in the present, Yunjong is crying in the stairwell of a random building, not knowing what she'd do next. 
Suddenly, a girl comfortingly hugs her. She asks the girl who she is, and the girl explains that she's a runaway like her. It's supposed to be cold tonight, so she was just hoping to hug her so they won't freeze to death. Thus, Nunjong allows the girl to hug her all the while thinking of her older sister. Meanwhile, Huijin and Hanrim happily watch over Yeri hugging Yunjong. They were glad that they decided to bring Yeri along after all since the kids clearly don't trust adults anymore. She then tells Hanrim to watch over the girls while he guards them outside. Hanrim asks Huijin what they would do with the wound helper since she's clearly using all the runaway kids as workers in crime. Wedgen smiles and tells her that taking care of that whole operation is actually very easy. Later that day, the TRPA's website and social media account announced that they will be launching a new runaway support group. There will be free food and housing, and they promise not to contact their parents nor collect any personal information. A few days later, the helper woman is at the department store shopping for new bags and clothes. After paying with her credit card, she receives more messages from people asking for more girls and boys. Happy that her business is booming, she calls Cielion and orders her to send some of the boys and girls to their clients. However, Cielion tells her some bad news. Half of the kids they've been sheltering had run away last night. Meanwhile, more and more kids are answering the TRPA's call for safe shelter and Yuri assures the oncoming kids that they'll be taken care of there. Not only that, a group of girls that came from the woman helper's old place apologizes to Yunjong for hitting her and being mean to her. Their boss made them do it, but now that they're all safe, they just want to be safe. Yunjong smiles at them and happily welcomes them to the place. Even Hanrim and Weijin are glad that their plan is working. Weijin remarks that most runaways don't leave home planning to commit crimes. It's just that they don't have anywhere to stay so they're forced to. If they have a warm place to sleep and food in their stomachs, they won't get caught up in crime. Hanrim also suggests that they catch the helpers before they run away while all the kids are safely in their care. Wajid informs her that the helpers probably won't run away since people who have tasted that kind of money would probably not easily surrender that. Meanwhile, the helper woman is once again beating up one of the girls who tried to run away. Later, Siliong suggests that maybe they should just shut down their operation and move to the province. With the money they earned, they could just open a cafe or something. Unfortunately, the woman helper admits that she is broke. Not only does she have nothing saved up, but she also won't even be able to pay off their next month's credit card debt. Sia Leong angrily grabs the helper's shirt and demands that she get her pay. After all, the helper promised to pay her six months worth of rent when she became an adult. The helper calmly jams her cigarette at Sia Leong's face and shouts at her that she should be thankful for her. If not for the helper, she would have already been beaten to death by her stepfather or else should she still call her stepfather and report her location. This suddenly gives the helper an idea, and she announces that if the TRPA shelter won't contact the kid's parents, then she will. At the shelter, Yeri is telling Yunjong stories about her sister in prison. They are planning to visit her the next day in prison, so Yeri suggests that they should go to sleep. While lying down in bed, Yunjong can't sleep since her body is used to working during the night. She kept thinking about her sister and based on Yeri's story, she realized that her sister probably felt safest in prison. Meanwhile, her phone suddenly rings and what she reads from it shocks her. A little while later, all the girls who ran away from the woman helper are slowly coming back to her with their heads down. The woman smiles at them and threatens that if they were even one minute late, she would have told their parents where they are. She then abruptly grabs Yanjan by the hair and starts slapping her around for running away. She tells them that they were fools to trust the government since they would just call their parents and send them back to their hell homes. She reminds them that for runaway kids, there's no place where they would be safe. However, Yunjong suddenly speaks up and replies to the woman that there is a place where they will give you a warm place to sleep and three meals a day. It's a place where parents or even cruel people like the helpers cannot follow. She then reaches into her pocket and pulls out a knife. Back at the shelter, Yeri wakes up to find a letter from Yunjong telling her that she'll find her sister herself. Meanwhile, Yunjong slashes the helper with a knife, wounding her in the arm. Yunjong had started muttering to herself about how long she can stay in prison where she'll finally be safe from her father. The helper tries to order the other kids to stop Yunjong, but they're all afraid of the deranged girl wielding a knife. Realizing that Yunjong is planning to murder her, the helper runs away for her life. While running, the helper realized that prison doesn't sound bad compared to being a runaway teen. When she herself ran away back then, she went through hell. While running, she ended up bumping into Hanrim and Yuri. Hanrim immediately punches her in the face, knocking her down. 
When Yunjum appears wielding a knife, Hanrim calmly tries to convince her to put it down. Instead, Yunjong is about to bring down the knife on the unconscious helper, but Yeri suddenly hugs her and tells her that if she does that, the TRPA would send her to prison like what they did to her. Yunjong replies that going to prison is what she wants so Yeri should let her go. Yeri instead tells her that what the TRPA wants more than catching bad guys is the safety of the victims. She assures her that the wardens have always been three steps ahead of the bad guys. As such, Yeri promises that no one's going to get dragged back home. The woman helper laughs and tells them they won't be able to keep that promise. After all, she had already sent the text informing all the parents of the runaway kids where their children are. Meanwhile, the front of the shelter is filled with parents shouting at Weijin to bring their kids out. They accuse Weijin of kidnapping their children illegally and threaten to call the police. Yunjong trembles at the thought of seeing her dad, while the helper shouts out that that's why people like her are needed so runaways can have some place to stay. Yuri and Hanrim cringe at what she's saying, and they inform her that they already took that into account. In fact, it's a good thing that the helper called the parents. At the shelter, Weijin starts handcuffing the parents and tells them that he's glad they're there and calling the police. He then points out their own crimes, from sexual assault against a minor, domestic abuse, child negligence, or gaslighting. He assures them that he has enough handcuffs for all of them. Thanks for watching. If you like the content, give a like and subscribe for more videos. See you next time.